I've already talked about the scientific method in a prior video. I was thinking of wrapping everything up in one nice package, but it was getting a bit too long, so I figured that I would split them. Another sticking point with flat earthers is an increasingly narrow definition of what an experiment actually entails. In their definition, an experiment is something where the independent variable is directly manipulated by the experimenter, and a dependent variable is something that is directly observed whilst all the confounding variables are controlled for. Now, this is a rather nice and easy description of a rather elegant, classic controlled lab based experiment and I have no issues with that but it is not the only method by which we can investigate things in science. There are generally two types of investigations. We have the proper experiments and observational methods and each investigation methodology has advantages and disadvantages and as such methods of each type tend to be preferred by different disciplines. Experiments are generally the easiest to understand. This is where the experimenter manipulates some independent variables and observes a change in some dependent variables. Now, note my use of the word some as you are not restricted to only one, even though it would be ideal. Experiments come in many shapes and sizes, down from seeing whether an egg will sink or float in a given medium, right up to the Large Hadron Collider. And there are also many types, such as your classic controlled lab-based experiment, field experiments or randomized controlled trials. On the other extreme we have observational studies where the experimenter has no control over any of the variables or at least not in a traditional sense. More importantly there's no control over the independent variable and this means that we cannot always establish causal links and will have to do with correlations. In observational studies the researcher takes a large data set and studies it for patterns to discern correlations between different quantities. There is minimal interference from the researcher. There are also many other types of observational methods which can be employed in science. These generally are longitudinal studies, cross-sectional studies and case control studies. And finally we have natural experiments or quasi-experiments which are observational in nature but can often deliver the same predictive power as experiments and even allow for establishing causation provided that the theory is well understood. When considering an approach for investigating something, you have to consider how viable your approach is. Ideally, we would be able to study everything within the confines of a laboratory as we have the greatest control over everything. Now, it is easy to study semiconductors in a lab and there's no sense in doing a large scale observational study. However, I challenge you to create the right conditions for studying galaxy formation in a lab. So practicality is something that we have to consider over control. Now, ethics is another important consideration. It is generally okay to ask families to fill in questionnaires and get children to perform a series of tasks at regular intervals during their childhood so you can study their development. It is definitely not okay to create a cohort of children that grows up in a controlled environment of the lab. So it may be worth just relaxing your need for control in exchange for not being a dick. In addition, the lab environment is also pretty artificial. And if you want to study behavior, then you want the participant to be in a natural environment. Now to figure out how useful each methodology is, we have to look at some of the different types. Controlled experiments are generally the kind of experiments that are the easiest. The experimenter manipulates one or more variables, ideally one, and then observes the outcome. The experimenter then establishes the relationship between two quantities. The advantage of the controlled experiment is that they're relatively easy and this is why from a predictive capability standpoint physics is the most successful and advanced of all the scientific disciplines. It's also the easiest. Our methods give us the ability to establish cause and effect easily provided the experiment is performed properly and all avenues are investigated thoroughly. Just because you have manipulated one quantity and saw a change in the other doesn't mean that your IV is the only cause or even the direct cause and it definitely does not automatically mean that you have identified a mechanism. Fortunately, lab-based experiments are easy to set up and you can easily investigate these things. Now there are great advantages of controlled experiments. As the name suggests, precise control is possible and the experiments are easiest to reproduce. However, when you deal with more complicated systems such as animals and human beings, then you may run into trouble. Firstly, ethics approval is a bitch and in the case of psychological studies, the participants are brought in and are often deceived to a certain extent as for the purposes of the study, as revealing the true nature impacts the results. And then we have the problem that we are studying a participant in an artificial environment. You also have the problem of scale. You can't exactly reproduce star formation in a lab and even if you could, the process will take longer than human history. In a field experiment, the experimenter takes the experiment out of the lab and into 
the field, surprisingly. Uh, the experimenter loses the artificial nature of the lab, but also loses some control over the confounding variables. And you can probably imagine that this method is less than useless for physicists or chemists, but brilliant for the social or biological sciences. Why wouldn't you study an animal's behavior in its natural habitat? Now, surprisingly, this is a pretty recent development in experimental methods. Now, one of the great innovations in science is the randomized control trial, which allows us to do useful things like testing medical procedures and medicines. And its gold standard, the double-blind randomized clinical trial, takes participants and randomly assigns them to a treatment group or a placebo group, and the investigator is not aware of who is in which group. Now, this approach is important when you want to remove bias. However, there are some big drawbacks in this process. Ethical limitations can sometimes make it very hard to properly investigate medicines, and it can be very difficult to recruit a cohort and often nigh on impossible to recruit a representative cohort. And then there's natural experiments. Now, some people would frown at me for calling them natural experiments as there's little experimentation involved. The preferred term is quasi-experiment, but I'll keep it nice and accessible. In a natural experiment, we can exploit well-defined variation or exposure, which is naturally present, and see how this has an effect. Basically, a natural experiment comes in the form of a data set where it just looks like an experiment actually physically manipulated an independent variable, even though no one did. One example is a 2004 study into a smoking ban in Helena, Montana, where the local government trialed a smoking ban in public places. The researchers then pulled the local hospital data to investigate the effect on heart disease and found what looked like a dramatic 40% decrease in heart attacks. Now, once the smoking ban was lifted, the number of heart attacks went back up. Now, I like this study because it is a great example of natural experiments, but also a great example of really bad science. But the smoking bans that have been introduced over the past two decades will actually provide a better opportunity to do some natural experiments. This is because the smoking bans came in at different times for different countries and therefore we could expect the effects to follow a similar pattern. Natural experiments are the bread and butter of the astronomer. If you want to study the evolution of spiral arm galaxies like the Milky Way, then you get as much data of as many spiral arm galaxies as you can and you then figure out how old they are. You can then take the age as the independent variable and then a property that you're interested in as your dependent variable. And then you figure out how they are related by testing different models. Now, the advantage of natural experiments is that even though gathering data can be hard, once you've got it, then there's a lot to work with. A single space probe can generate enough data to keep a lot of astronomers very happy for a very long time. The data can also be sufficient to infer causation from your study, provided that you know the relationship between confounding variables so you can tease them apart. Now, economists and social researchers also use these types of experiments a lot, using census data, tax information, or educational records. However, here we deal with other problems, and that is that there are no exact relationships between the different confounding variables. And here we deal with statistical relationships rather than the nice and precise models that we have in physics. Overall, this results in an inability to establish causation, and we consider correlation instead. In this situation, we can speculate about causal mechanisms and possibly formulate a good hypothesis, which we can test using other methods. Finally, we have observational studies, which tend to be the weapon of choice for psychologists. Just like natural experiments, the researcher has no control over any of the variables, and you exploit natural variability within a population. However, there are no means of establishing a cause and effect relationship because the variability is not well defined. We cannot compare the conditions which we expect will influence the outcome that we are interested in. In observational studies, we can take one of three approaches. We have cross-sectional, longitudinal, and case control studies or a combination of the three. Now, in cross-sectional studies, we take a single snapshot of a population or a sample at a given time, and we try to relate different measures using statistical methods. Now, cross-sectional studies are cheap and easy. You can usually rent a data set from your country's central statistics agency and go nuts on it. However, in longitudinal studies, they aren't that cheap, and they're definitely not easy. Longitudinal studies involve recording a series of measures at different points in time. It involves recruiting participants who will have to come in at several points in the space of several weeks, months, or even years. Now, the great benefit is that you get a time-resolved picture of what is happening to your different measures. And unlike a cross-sectional study where you get information about DV as a function of an IV, you can get information about how the DV changes with time as a function of the IV.
Case control studies are useful for identifying possible causes. Note the word possible. This approach involves taking two groups which appear to be similar but have one particular difference, namely a disease. You take the cases which are the persons with a disease and then compare them to the controls which are the persons without the disease and then go through their history to try to establish what could possibly have caused the disease. The advantage of these kinds of studies is that they are quick, easy and they require very few resources. The problem is that participants' memories are patchy and the whole process is fraught with bias. However, they do regularly provide evidence that there are links which should be investigated. Although observational studies cannot establish causation, establishing correlation is useful as well. As a physicist, I would say that the correlation bit is interesting as this gives you opportunities to formulate interesting questions and create a good hypothesis. However, it may not always be a good idea to take these questions into the lab and we have to settle for correlations. A recurring theme through these different methods is control. Each method comes with varying levels of control over the independent variable and other factors. The further away you move from lab-based controlled experiments, the less control you have. Or as I said at the start, at least in a traditional sense. Just because the researcher doesn't have physical control, it doesn't mean that they have lost all control. And in the next video, I will be talking about how we establish control over these different quantities.